As with um, previous sessions, we now have the opportunity for questions and comments. Um, we again have two roving microphones, uh, so please indicate if you would like to ask a question uh, of our presenters. Uh, before you ask your question, I also ask that you state your name, country and organisation and we'll take questions direct to the panel at the table. So please indicate and someone will bring you a microphone. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, Lee Cordner, um, former Naval officer and now um, part-time academic. Um, my question is to um, our um, gentleman from the IMO. Um, I wonder in, in the context that you've outlined and the sort of ongoing um, need for a relationship between the world of merchant shipping and trade and, um, and maritime security, uh, and particularly with navies and coast guards, whether you might see a, um, a need and an opportunity for some sort of closer relationship, even a formal or semi-formal relationship between entities like IONS, WP and S and the IMO. Um, you already outlined RECAP, Djibouti, Code of Conduct, that sort of relationship where IMO is very involved in the anti-piracy world, but I wonder if there might be a uh, need and a prospect of a close relationship between the IMO and the regional coordinating bodies like IONS and WPNS. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, for, thank you very much for the question. Uh, IMO is the collective will of the 170 member states. That's the decision makers. They are assisted by a number of organizations in consultative status that have proved to the 170 member states, to the council, they have a global reach, they're relevant, they contribute, they're non sort of aligned politically, etc. And so organizations like RECAP, um, International Maritime Bureau, various others, are members of, are, are therefore uh, given a voice at IMO advising the members of them. Who represents the country at IMO is up to the country themselves. Now, generally, there is a, a department, usually the Maritime Authority, that is the head of delegation, but when it comes to issues relating to security, usually they will bring along their subject matter experts be they from State Department, Foreign Affairs, Defense, uh, Police, whatever, to the relevant committee. So there's no reason why states can't bring their own militaries along. In fact, we positively encourage it. Uh, whether or not individual organizations will be appropriate, that is, is something that, that uh, would need to be decided by the member states, but I don't see any reason why not. Thanks. Any further questions? Uh, yes. Richard Herbert Burns from the uh, Stimson Centre. A question for Chris. Um, Chris, has, has there been any um, international studies or analysis that you're aware of of the state of uh, the ports and terminals around the world? There, there have been, yeah, IMO doesn't have a specific role in terms of assessment of port facilities. Uh, some countries are doing that. The United States has a very vibrant port security inspection program, uh, and they, ha on a bilateral basis, advise governments on the, the security implementation in their ports. Uh, there are also organization, international organizations, such as the International Association of Ports and Harbors, that go around looking at uh, port facilities and within that context would, would advise them. But IMO itself doesn't have that particular role. We will go into countries, we will conduct needs assessment missions, we will conduct assessments if requested to do so. We've also produced guidance on self-assessment uh, 
of port facilities, but we don't actually have a policing, a, a mandated policing role. Any further questions? Well, just while we're waiting, um, Lou, in your presentation, you mentioned um, about the designated shipping corridors, and your example was the uh, northwest coast of, of Australia. Um, now, how confident are you that industry will agree and comply if these corridors are actually made mandatory? And then I've got a follow-on uh, to that question for you, Chris, is what do you see the role of the IMO in, in, these, in these corridors? Thank you, Brett. Um, I think, first of all, um, in, in developing these sorts of uh, corridors, it's extremely important that uh, the regulators do it in conjunction with industry so that uh, the masters who are using particular corridors at the moment, and, and they do vary from sometimes from trip to trip, um, are in fact, you know, believe there are advantages in doing so. But I would be reasonably confident that, and I can't obviously speak on behalf of um, the, sh the worldwide shipping industry, but from what I've seen uh, in Australia that, uh, uh, you know, for example, the, the vessel tracking system that uh, applies in the Great Barrier Reef uh, from the vessel tracking system that is in Townsville, that there is a high degree of cooperation by the foreign shipping industry, foreign flag shipping industry in complying with those requirements, as is um, uh, compulsory pilotage, for example, in the Torres Strait. Um, there again is uh, a high incidence of compliance. So in summary, uh, my view is that uh, yes, there would be uh, uh, if, if developed properly and in conjunction with industry, there would be a high level of compliance uh, with the use of mandatory um, corridors because I think it has a great deal of advantage for the, the shipping industry, as it does for navies. Uh, if you could restrict, uh, even in terms of hydrographic services and many other aspects of, uh, of the navy uh, in terms of security, uh, it would have, I believe, great advantages for both industry and navy. Thanks, Lou. And, and the role of the IMO, Chris? Yeah, uh, where, where these uh, proposals are uh, for safety, uh, where they're consistent with international law, for example, uh, UNCLOS, uh, then the proposals are generally brought to IMO, the people that deal with safety and navigation. So, for example, traffic separation schemes or routing ships in particularly sensitive sea areas. Uh, and, and once accepted, the, the details are then promulgated. Uh, for example, in a military context, the internationally recognized transit corridor going through the Gulf of Aden was brought to IMO and a safety and navigation circular was then promulgated to all member states saying, you know, this is now the approved route. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Lou. Uh, any further questions? Yes, over here on the right. Thank you, Chair. Jane Chan from the Rajaram School in Singapore. A question for Mr. Russell, actually, um, and, and this is very much... Um, with reference to um, Chris' presentation on IMO's rules and regulation on safety and security. Perhaps you can share with us uh, a shipping industry perspective on whether some of these rules and regulations are in fact functional and relevant, because I think in, in your presentation you mentioned that you know, in, in terms of some of the environmental regulation is, is becoming a bit costly to industry. Thank you. C sorry, could I just get clarification? You're referring to piracy or? Just, just safety and security in general, the, the, the IMO regulations and, and rules mm. are in that sense, thank you. Uh, again, uh, industry was involved, certainly our um, International Chamber of Shipping and other international industry bodies were heavily involved in the creation of the ISPIS code. Um, and uh, I think as Chris mentioned, uh, in terms of, of shipboard security, it wasn't that difficult, um, although added, of course, uh, in terms of um, a regulation impact, but uh, officers and training of, of crew. Um, and in certain countries, uh, and Australia is one of them, uh, they introduced a visa system for all foreign uh, seafarers, visited Australia, uh, had to have a special visa. It's an electronic visa. Uh, I think the industry, uh, that was done again in close cooperation with uh, Shipping Australia, for example, here in in Australia, and I think where regulators do involve industry in, in at the early stage of developing such regulations have a much greater chance of success. The, um, there are direct advantages for industry in a high security outcome, uh, naturally, as mentioned before, and uh, the overall view of, of industry, uh, internationally in the shipping industry, in relation to security uh, is, is highly supportive, and uh, they'll do what they can. Uh, primarily because of the direct uh, commercial and economic benefits that flow 
uh, from good security compliance and outcomes. Right. Thanks, Lou. Uh, any more questions? I've just got uh, one more for you, Chris, here. Uh, towards the end of your presentation, you talked about um, your pillars. Um, how resilient do you think those pillars are as individual pillars uh, of your maritime security strategy? Um, resource constraints and, and capacity may only allow countries to focus on some or, or parts of, uh, of these pillars. Now, if these pillars are not progressed in a complementary manner, how successful is, is that strategy? The short answer would probably be not very. Uh, what we are trying to, what we're trying to do is address a series of law enforcement challenges in one go. And whether it's piracy and armed robbery, or whether it's illegal fishing, or illegal migration, or dumping toxic waste, or search and rescue, they all require the same things. They require a national legal framework. They need appropriate situational awareness, so you know where the threats are, where the people are. They need some sort of ability to get out and interdict, and they need uh, a, a legal follow-up to it. So what we're trying to, the, the approach we're trying to take is, is, first of all, no one agency is in charge. A lot of agencies think they are, but in any one situation, you will have any, at any one time, different agencies will, will, uh, will take charge. For example, in the, in the piracy context, it's a law enforcement situation. So the Navy may well be out there providing the taxi, but it's actually law enforcement that does the takedown, does the prosecution, et cetera, because that's not what navies do in, in many cases. Similarly, so we're trying to push the idea of joined up thinking. If you've got a Navy but no Coast Guard, great. Use the Navy as the vehicle. Get the Navy out there with fishery protection officers on board, with narcotics officers on board, with safety of navigation people, whatever. Get some bilateral agreements between the government departments and maybe get some money coming back. So if, because of the presence of the Navy with fishery protection on board, they're driving up compliance, more people are paying licenses, uh, more revenue coming from the fisheries, some of that money comes back to the Navy, pays for fuel, you've got a win-win situation. So we're almost going in there, first of all, suggesting selling the concept of a national maritime strategy. First of all, how am I going to use the wet bit? And this is a, a challenge in, in a lot of countries which are essentially very land-focused, that the border is actually 200 miles that way, and you've got potential offshore oil and gas, you've got fisheries, you've got seabed resources, that all need to be developed to make money, but need to be underpinned by good maritime security to protect it. And once you start going on that approach, rather than talking about counter-terrorism, which may not interest some of the countries, or counter-piracy, which may be a peripheral interest, then uh, you generate that draft. So a simple, simple one agency doesn't do it all approach. So one pillar won't work. 